What's going on guys? My name is Mr. Hurricane and welcome to the Minnesota Dynasty Season 3 edited off season version as we end Season 3 and finally make the move to Season 4 in the Minnesota Dynasty. I will be recapping everything that happened in the long off season live stream last week and getting you guys ready for Season 4 in the series. First we are starting things off with Season 3 statistics. And obviously we went 8-6 and six and overall I was happy with the offensive side of the football. I thought Philip Nelson had a good senior season, 24 touchdowns, 13 picks, as well as setting the new Minnesota single season record with passing yards, most of those going to Andre McDonald, fellow senior, and KJ May, another senior on offense. We're also losing our 1,000 yard rusher, Roderick Williams, and on defense, graduating Theron Cochran, 16 sacks. As well as Devon Drake Campbell, who is my defensive MVP so far for this entire series of the way he just seems to always make big plays when you need them. He gets a lot of tackles, just makes a lot of plays in the backfield. Also losing our top interception guy, Eric Murray, our second corner. And so we're graduating a lot of our key players. And now we're going to see the statistical legacy they'll leave behind. All of these stats have happened in this series. So Philip Nelson in three years is our starting quarterback, almost 8,000 passing yards. 62 touchdowns, 45 interceptions. Roderick Williams, one year as a starter, 1,400 rushing yards and 10 scores. Did not play much when we had Danell Kirkwood for two years. Then Andre McDonald, 160 receptions, 2,041 receiving yards, and only 11 touchdowns. Seems kind of low to me. And only 11 drops. That's pretty good for three seasons. Then Devondre Campbell. It seems in my dynasty I always have superb linebacker play, and I'll miss this guy with all those tackles and just all the plays he made. And with three seasons now in the books, we have graduated almost every key player from the start of the series. It's becoming more and more my team and my recruits, and you'll see a lot of the guys that are graduating now, and two transfers, Garrett Outlaw, a left guard, and Calvin Pope, a halfback. Not major priorities for me, especially because I've been stocking up on running backs, and I've been prepared for this situation. So no major worries, then you see our list of graduates. We have a lot of very good players that are now moving on. And here are your NFL draft results, as once again, no draft picks from the Minnesota Gophers. That really surprised me. But what is good news is that Melvin Gordon has graduated from the Wisconsin Badgers, and he's been drafted. So no more Melvin Gordon having to worry about him in this series. He was a nightmare to defend against. Now, let's move on to the offseason recruiting, where we find out who is going to be a Minnesota Gopher in this season to come and beyond, as Andy McKenzie has become the top priority. After Tyrone Campbell committed to the University of Iowa, I had to find a backup plan at quarterback, and McKenzie was a gem prospect that has all the tools I want. Speed, throw power, got to develop the accuracy, but I think it could definitely work out. You can see some of the guys we already have. Martin Parker, a five-star wideout. Maurice Pratt, a speed juco running back. And I wanted the structure of this recruiting so that I could make sure I got my highest priorities. And Andy McKenzie has been my top priority now for a long time. But the way I set up my points probably wasn't the best way to go about it. This is only my third time doing the offseason, so I'm still learning as I go a little bit. But there wasn't a major battle for Andy McKenzie. And I still wanted to get a lot of other prospects. And I still have a pretty full list at this point. And I'm spreading my points pretty thin between all the prospects. So now, who are the next Minnesota Golden Gophers? You can see Jonathan Starks, the top outside linebacker, has committed to Minnesota, but not very many other players have. James Gray, a 75 overall safety, he's going to Missouri, along with an athlete, Tyrone McDonald. Some corners are leaving to other schools, Matt Walker, a very high-rated athlete, Tom Moss, an outside linebacker, and a lot of these races... I wasn't even close to winning, and I know I put too many points into McKenzie now because there wasn't a battle for him. I, I'm i still understanding the mechanics, and I wasn't sure if Nebraska would still put points on him, so I tried. I had to play it safe. I got McKenzie, but I missed it on guys like Ryan Duncan and Tom Moss. And James Gray, that safety, I barely missed it on, so that was definitely a missed opportunity. But overall, a lot of these guys I wasn't going to win anyway, it appears, but I still could have done a much better job. And I learned quite a few things during this offseason, so I think I'll do a much better job in the future. We ended up with a 53rd ranked recruiting class. And in my opinion, it's a little bit underwhelming because we could have had a lot more good prospects. Even though we got a few very good ones, I still could have done a lot better. And I thought I missed it on a lot of good players. But now let's move to position changes. We have the athlete, Andy McKenzie. 
And I wanted him to be a quarterback. He has 83 speed. He has 87, I believe, throw power and 79 accuracy. He also has the skills necessary to play wide receiver, but he best fits as a quarterback, and that's the reason why I wanted him to be a quarterback of the future. And that's where I put him. Next, Jonathan Starks, the top outside linebacker. I honestly thought about putting him at safety. He's got very good speed, and I was concerned about his block shedding in pursuit, but I decided to keep him at outside linebacker, at least for the meantime. We'll move on to progression and see who got better and in what areas. And Mitch Leidner, senior quarterback, goes up five overall points, and his throw accuracy is very good. No major cannons on our team. Not a lot of throw power besides Andy McKenzie. At halfback, Kevin Martindale, he's going to be the feature back this year. He goes up five points as well. And Lamar Washington's going to find his way into the offense as well. At fullback, Tyler Hartman, the senior, gets a little bit better. He was already a beast. At receiver, Drew Olatarski is turning into a superstar. And Doug Duckett. Hopefully he doesn't drop the ball as much this year as catching goes up four points. And he dropped eight passes last year. McDonald dropped 11 in three years. He can't have a repeat performance in that category. Adam Kirkpatrick, after starting all but one game last season, he gets a nice boost up. He's a great receiving tight end. Our offensive line is where my main concerns on offense lie. I have not done a very good job building depth in this area. And from my experiences in recruiting, it's harder to get the really good linemen compared to some of the receivers and other positions I've been able to get a lot of depth in. So I have to do a much better job with O-line because I've really slacked on the depth while being kind of relying upon a couple of good players that were already on the team when I began the series. Moving on to linebacker, and there's going to be a lot of competition this year. There's a lot of guys who are on the same range ability-wise, and there's not a standout anymore like Devondre Campbell. Obviously, Jack Lynn is safe on the inside, but outside linebacker is going to be interesting. At corner, Sam Graves, he's becoming a more reliable number one guy. Three interceptions last year, and look at those ratings in man and zone coverage. He's got to shut down that side of the field and help bring our pass defense back to relevancy. And we have Antonio Johnson, who is in line to be the new starter with Demarius Travis graduating, and Andre Gaines. Despite a year that I didn't think was that good, we don't have much to challenge him for his job, so we'll see how things go early in the year. Otherwise, Anthony Parks may get his shot, or perhaps a freshman somewhere. But here are the top-rated players now on the roster. Drew Olatarski is at the very top of the list. And now with no Andre McDonald, we're going to rely on him a lot more. We'll move on to the cutting players aspect of the offseason. And all we have to do is cut one guy because I didn't recruit as well as I was hoping I would and I ended up having too many walk-ons. So is this the year where we finally cut Leon Daniels? We couldn't last year. We would have been too thin at middle linebacker. We can do it now, but we'll hold off. Matt Lawrence, a walk-on left end, and I just can't work with those ratings. It's just not going to happen. I can't work with Leon either, but that's why he rides the bench. Let's move on to scheduling. In my dynasties, I generally have a very tough non-conference schedule to keep it entertaining, and I don't play FCS teams. I wanted to make it a little bit easier this year, as we had UTSA, Auburn, and NC State last season. We're going to open the year against Army, we'll play UTSA again, and then we play Notre Dame later in the year. That should be very fun. That's in MetLife Stadium. Now, redshirting some of the incoming freshmen. And the decision has been made on starting quarterback for the coming year. Andy McKenzie, true freshman, is going to be redshirted. And Mitch Leidner is your day one starting quarterback taking over for Philip Nelson in this series. At tight end, we're also going to redshirt Mark Green. He's a sophomore Juco transfer. At defensive tackle, we'll redshirt both Brian Weaver and Ben Alexander. Then at outside linebacker, we of course had Jonathan Starks, and I'm going to redshirt him because we have plenty of competition there and guys who I'm okay with, Ray Dixon, Dan Smith, but I'm okay with taking the redshirt off if need be, but I don't want to lose a year of eligibility for guys that barely play. And I really had to think about that because we had a couple of guys on offense that I really wanted to play, but wouldn't be full-time starters. And one of those guys, speed back Maurice Pratt. Fastest guy on the roster, but we're going to redshirt him. And then five-star wideout Martin Parker. He's just so buried on the depth charts. To have him as only a kick returner, as a 4-5 or five receiver, you're better off redshirting. And I'm risking some of these guys possibly transferring. And I'll have to think about whether or not I want to pull the redshirt off anybody. 
Um, you'd have to think with Martindale getting hurt or if a top receiver of ours gets hurt, maybe I'll lift the red shirt off Maurice Pratt and or Martin Parker. But for the time being, for guys not to play very much, they have the red shirt. And I don't think I've ever lifted the red shirt off anybody before. And I hope this does not come back to hurt me if I leave the red shirt on these players for the entire season. Because our top recruits, they're all red shirted. There's just competition at certain areas, depth in certain areas, and it's just not working out for those guys to be playing year one, like with Sam Graves, where I had to graduate five corners in the first two years of the series. And so I pretty much had to play them. Let's take a look at Tyrone Campbell now, who is a wide receiver, not a quarterback for Iowa, and he is the fourth receiver on their depth chart. I cannot wait to play Iowa this season. It has kind of a Fred Arnold feeling from it from the UTSA dynasty. Now for the rest of the duration of this video, you're going to be watching some practice highlights. You're seeing our new first team offense and first team defense. And I'm not going to talk about the gameplay too much. I'm going to talk about just kind of the team going forward and some of my thoughts on the offense and the defense and what I'm working towards. On offense, I really love the implementation of this pistol shotgun offense. Ever since early in season two, it's been our offense. And I've added formations, plays, and different designs to the playbook every season. And you won't see it in this practice, but after the stream was done, I spent well over an hour kind of getting new formations in the playbook and tailoring it to our players. We no longer have a dual threat quarterback. Leidner might be able to escape the pocket, get a few yards every now and then, but he is definitely not as fast as Philip Nelson was. I think numbers wise, Leidner's somewhere in the low 70s and Nelson was a low 80s for speed. So not as many option plays this year, although you see one right there. I have to figure out how much I can use the play action boot if Leidner can outrun defensive ends and and that's one of the big things of the offense. I love the running game and the play action pass game that builds off of it. But Leidner has a very accurate arm, so we can still spread the field and go four or five wide and utilize this receiver depth that I think I've done a pretty good job of building. And we still have plenty of guys who haven't even gotten a chance to play yet. But Leidner's a good quarterback. He's come in many times for Philip Nelson because Nelson would get hurt, it seemed three times, four times a season, and Leidner had a decent amount of passes last year. And I know in the comment sections from reading the comments, a lot of people thought Leidner should have been starting a long time ago. So I thought it was the right time to let Leidner play. Let McKenzie be registered. We're not going to have an Evan Newton situation, really, like we did uh, in UTSA Dynasty. But we have a couple new players on offense as well to look out for, and here's one of them right here. Lamar Washington was almost our number one halfback last year until I realized we had an awesome player in Roderick Williams. And I believe he is a redshirt junior, so we still get two years to use him. And now you're going to see kind of a battle I had going in practice. Jamel Harbison, who is now our number two receiver, and Sam Graves, our number one corner. I was testing out our secondary and just seeing who would jump passes, who would make plays. And how often have we seen Jamel Harbison in games? Not very often. So I wanted to see him here in practice because I don't want to miss out on a guy like I didn't know how good KJ May was until we played him last year and he led the team in reception. So I just threw it up, wanted to see what Harbison can do. And he's pretty good. And Sam Graves gave him a good fight as well. And I like Leidner's arm. But Kevin Martindale is going to be our number one running back. And you guys know he has great speed, but we have to see if he can handle getting 20 plus carries a game. We run the ball, a lot of times we run it more than we pass. And our top three halfbacks are going to be Martin Dale, Berkeley Edwards, and Lamar Washington. Now, let's get a chance to see Andy McKenzie, our quarterback. I did not lift the red shirt off of him. I ended up quitting out of the practice so we could see him play a little bit. I mean, he can't play with the guy, but I want to practice with him and see what he can do. And I wanted to show him off in the live stream. So here is Andy McKenzie. He's not going to play this year, barring something unforeseen at this point. Nice catch by Drew. But obviously, I have big plans for this team relating to Andy McKenzie. But sadly, this is probably the only time you're going to see him here in Season 4. So we'll see him again probably next year, and we'll see what happens going forward in the Minnesota Dynasty. I know I fail to talk about defense in this, but we graduated, obviously, Devondre Campbell, Theron Cochran. We have question marks on defense. We have to figure out if the secondary is improved, if we can be more consistent in the run game, and if we can't, we are going to run the no huddle offense, extend the games, and try to outscore teams because we have a very good offense, I think, and if our defense isn't improved, we're just going to try to score 40 or 50 every game and run no huddle and just take no time off the clock to score. 
That's what I want to do. Don't let our defense lose us games. And hopefully we have a very successful season four. But I'm very excited to kick off the season. You can expect week one against the Army tomorrow on my channel. And I'm not showing any recruiting yet because even though I did some in the stream, I did a lot of work on my board and scouting after the stream was over. And so the board looks completely different now. And you'll see what it looks like for the first time in week one following the game against the Army. But thank you for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed the offseason, although it wasn't as good as I had hoped it would be. I hope it's a lot better next year, but I'm still very excited for Season 4. I hope we can improve off of our 8-6 and six bowl loss season last year. But thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you in Week 1. Hope you're excited for Season 4. Let me know in the comment section what players you're most excited to see. And I'll see you guys when we take on Army and kick off Season 4. Have a great day, guys, and I'll see you tomorrow.